Game Builder Garage is one of those odd little Nintendo games that, like Labo, just kind of comes out of nowhere, but is built to incentivize creativity and engineering with some degree of artistry. Of course, Garage's focus is in the name, and was easily compared to Dreams which let you remake Final Fantasy VII Remake, PT, and Sonic titles, the latter two acting as a borderline litmus test for whether your engine is worth using. And sure enough, people have made such titles in Garage, but does that mean it's worth pursuing with its $30 price tag? While it's easy to look at free engines like Unity, Godot, Unreal, Game Maker, and even Roblox and say, no, I think that answer, while true, easily passes over how Game Builder Garage is in itself not only not the best representation of how games are built, it lacks more creative and efficient methods of problem solving, and in a way is less game builder, more proof of concept builder. Now that might sound odd, but the reason for this is that the player is only ever permitted 512 nodons and 1024 connections between them in a single scene. Nodons are these cute little boxes that act as the game's language, they'll probably be a smash stage one day, but they contain data for inputs, logic, effects, collision, and the ultimate killer, texts and objects some of which might be invisible, hazardous, or change color. You can even customize a few of them. They're deceptively powerful, and the game's tutorials do a really good job of showcasing this, alongside some general aspects of how games themselves do lie to the player. One tutorial has you colliding with spheres that send you back to the game's beginning, but they're invisible, and a separate object instead acts to indicate where those portals are, showcasing how illusory games can be sometimes. It doesn't really teach you what makes good or bad level design, but it at least provides the tools for you to toy with them and figure out what hurts or helps a level's flow and challenge. For the basics of how games are made, this is great, but the issue is while nodons are powerful, they're only powerful in certain fields like teleporters or character controllers, which would be much more complex if you were coding them yourself. It's obvious. It's once you start looking for complex or specialized behavior that the game doesn't already provide that nodons start to fall apart. I think a great example of this is the game Shmup Tutorial and Player Made Rail Shooters. In order in order to stop players from going off screen, all four sides are blocked in with box nodons, which are then repeated from beginning to the end. Through other nodon, you can have them move forward at the same rate of the camera so that, theoretically, in a larger stage, you save more nodes than you would need otherwise. And this works better for rail shooters than the shmup, because the bounding boxes won't collide with enemies when viewed from behind like in a Star Fox style. But if we were coding this game, we could actually do something different. We could create a rail that pulls along the player with the camera and bounding boxes, but we could also just hard code into our movement script a clamp that stops the player's position from going above or below certain values, saving us on unnecessary collisions, and all within a few simple lines of code. In fact, the fact that you can't code in anything like C Sharp or C++ is probably one of the game's great disappointments, even though I don't think anyone's really expecting it. Nodons, as they are now, are easy to compare to Unreal's blueprint system, which are great for those who lack more technical knowledge like the people who are likely to pick up Garage. But blueprints are more flexible, they're not only capable of working together with unique C++ code in specialized nodes, but given how an excessive amount of blueprints can negatively impact game performance where C++ would not, you can nativize them into C++ to avoid that impact, turning out results that, at times, are better than having coded it yourself. I'm going to link to a video in the description that showcases this, but you can see an example on screen right now. Anyways. So because we can't do that, we have to create an excessive amount of interlinking nodes that attempt to do the same thing but eat up more resources. Whether this limit exists for performance reasons, like with blueprints, I can't say, but this poses a problem for specific game genres. Out of all those that were showcased in trailers, they were incredibly simple, no matter if they were horror, puzzle, or shooter. RPGs were absent with fairly good reason, especially turn-based ones, because the more complex the game, the more likely it's unable to be made or the smaller its scope will have to be. Two garage demos that display this are a Doom Eternal remake complete with weapon swapping grenades and enemies that target the player, while a remake of Super Hot works, well, like Super Hot. But both last less than 30 seconds and use almost all nodons available to them, leaving little room for improvement. This might ultimately be as good as it gets for them, and with object instantiation being as messy as it currently is, an endless horde mode probably isn't going to offer much to enhance the experience given how primitive the AI in these projects often are. 
car, with tutorials failing to offer any satisfying solutions as well. In one provided, a car uses hitboxes to forcibly move left or right in a jarringly unnatural fashion, to the point losing to it's almost impossible given the slightest display of competency, as you're more encouraged to play with others for testing to save on nodons, even if that's not quite practical for most. That's not saying all ideas are impossible, you can make a turn-based RPG like Dragon Quest, but if you start introducing more complex mechanics like those in Shin Megami Tensei or Pokemon like leveling, stats, enemy variants, overworld maps, monster capturing, elements, and weakness integration, or anything else that makes up the genre's modern conventions, well, you can kind of see quickly how little space there is to work with. This does encourage a great deal of creative problem solving, of course, but you're probably never going to get that big and bombastic vertical slice that so many games market themselves on. Instead, what's made will be akin to, well, a test room. And if you're going to make unique stages in something like a platformer like Mario or, well, super hot like I mentioned, well, your options are limited. Teleporters can offer that illusion of entering new locales, but if you max out your nodons, anything else will have to be kept in a separate project file. And unlike other applications like Unity, you can't connect or transition between these two instances without quitting out entirely. It's just not great for testing and a massive inconvenience. Personally, there's just not much allowing for true creative expression in making games. Sure, it's easy to share these concepts with others and it's neat to play them, but if you're going in serious about game development, what Garage teaches you in terms of programming is limited in its overlap with the realities of it. It's inconvenient to work with, and the mere act of laying out scenes requires you to work in one of two objective angles, where nodon constantly overlap with one another and camera angles need to be adjusted and rotated both in the nodon screen and in the menu only to then be played to see if you got the angle right. It's really obtuse for no reason, when in something like Unity you can freely fly around the scene, see objects in real time as you inject them, and see a preview of a select camera angle even as you adjust it. You can even place one that mimics your editor's scene view with a simple hotkey. There's an inspector and asset list of everything currently being used so you can see and alter values while playtesting as well, for a better idea of what feels right in both terms of controls and general physics, for which you can even make your own systems for. And because scripts can be easily copied onto other objects, and values adjusted to apply for only one specific object, there's no need for duplicate code where some might be needed for small variations. You just need to redefine what each field does or contains through a simple text shift or item link. You can even turn objects into prefabs and instantiate them later on so that they're not constantly loaded in the background and hampering performance. Meaning, yes, you can make a truly endless horde mode in your Doom clone. Everything is so easy to access and edit that why Garage didn't do the same is kinda baffling. If you think that's too much to grasp for the younger audience Garage is meant to appeal to, then the kid-friendly Roblox would aim to disagree with you as it comes with a similar interface. And like Garage actually incorporates pre-made assets for players to block out their project. Even if tutorials aren't self-integrated, there's nothing stopping users from reading up on system documentation or a cheap Udemy course like most do with Unreal or Unity. YouTube itself offers such a wealth of content and many have made great success from small projects and chances are those using Garage will have to resort to some outside means anyways to learn more unique types of mechanics. Of course, YouTube tutorials can vary in digestibility based on the content level and speaker's quality, but generally they too offer their projects for downloads in ways where they can be easily reverse engineered. There's even an easy way to integrate notes that won't eat up resources like nodons, and because you're not limited by that scope, projects can go far and above Garage. So thinking back on that Doom clone, it's not hard to feel disappointed given how much time and effort must have gone into making something that pales in comparison to something like another clone made in Roblox that includes bigger worlds, more variety, and even online multiplayer. It's probably what Garage should have itself actually aimed to be more like, as in Roblox you can make fully fleshed out clones of Sonic games like Unleashed, rather than make a fan game actively fighting with Garage's systems. Better, if your project's completely original, you can even publish it on platforms like Steam. Now, there's myriads of other features and technical concepts like scriptable objects, cinematics, and VFX, but those are things you can concern yourself with later when they become necessary to development. Now, this probably sounds super unfair to Garage and the people that made these demos. Don't, don't get me wrong, these are talented people here, but given it's a novelty meant for beginners, and considering this is the same company that created Super Mario Maker, which itself featured a great deal of preview data, shifting scenes, and some at times greater complexity to its stages, with even fully player-made campaigns, well, it's obvious now, Garage is a half-baked concept. If you think even its simplistic form of design 
is a concession made because we are technically making 3D games with controllers? Well, the title itself actually features mouse support, and the ability to rotate objects based on local axes is something console games have done for decades, ultimately leaving it simple but not necessarily user friendly. To which I then question, if your code and project scope are so limited, what's the point if you're going to have to learn a new program and new ways of coding when you step into a marketable game development system? Why not save yourself the 30 and go right towards Unity or Unreal? Sure, they might seem overwhelming and obtuse at first, but like with most programs, once you learn more about it, that structure and layout start making sense and feel purposeful, and that's even without rearranging it to suit your preferences and needs. You can even use these for non-game development reasons. A friend of mine once used Unity to generate and determine where the best spots for cameras would be in a store to crack down on shoplifting, while others use them for VTubers, architecture, and the mangaka Inyo Asano has used Unreal to create and convert environments into manga backgrounds for his projects like Oyasumi Poon Poon and Dead Dead Demons DDD Destruction. You might even find yourself making or selling your own assets on that engine's own asset store, if that's something you're interested in while being able to buy others. There is a publishing fee for once you actually go to sell, of course, but given the scope and variety on display, it's more worth pursuing than something in Garage where for $30, you get to make a wide variety of proof of concepts that you have to develop elsewhere. And some are genuinely fun despite simplicity, but you'll probably never make a game in the sense most will likely be thinking of when they buy in. It's a fun novelty for kids or someone looking to see if game development is something they're interested in, and there's already some tutorials on YouTube and in the nodons of others' uploads that are looking to make more specialized titles, but if game development is something you're serious about, Garage is something I'd recommend avoiding. It's so closed off and does not translate well into the industry and those other engines outside utilities. If you're contemplating games but unsure, Roblox and Gmod are great starters, but otherwise Unity, Godot, and Unreal are the ones I'd recommend to anyone, with Unity and Godot probably being the most beginner friendly, but considering I learned Unity and Unreal at the same time with no problem, there's no reason you can't opt for one of those two over the other, there's many differences and Unreal will carry you further in some regards, but a smart user can generally overcome most of Unity's shortcomings, and as time's gone on it's proven to itself be a very powerful engine, and if you do use it, Bracky's made some fantastic tutorials for it, with Mix and Jam and Sebastian Leg doing some great explorations and getting certain effects, while also making those projects available for you to download and study, while Garbage and Meezeezeezeezees offer some good insight on Godot, I don't study the the other engines that much so I can't be that useful for them, but I have I have dabbled with it a little bit. And if game development interests you, I highly recommend you check them out. If you're not interested, some of their other videos like making PS1 style graphics, Death Stranding, or Overwatch in that style too, they're all great. I'll link those in the description and who knows, maybe once my game is a little more than some art and pods in an empty space, I'll start showing that off here too instead of just on Twitter where it's largely just concept art. And if you want, remember, game engines engines aren't your only choice, people have made careers and games in tools like Flash or Python. The ones I've listed are just the ones most used because they're the most accessible and with that out of the way, thank you so much for watching, I will see you all in a future video or stream, I'm going to be streaming The World Ends With You and a little bit more frequently on Twitch lately, check me out, uh, there's a like and subscribe button if you feel so inclined, but until next time, bye bye.